Some entrepreneurs in China were onto a pretty sweet thing. While the mainstream graphics card market had abandoned any gamers whose pockets weren't deep enough, these companies were making a killing from remanufacturing old X-mining Polaris GPUs into new budget gaming cards. With just some spare RAM chips, dirt cheap heat sinks, and a Western word generator app for making the brand names, the folks over at Clistry, Peladin, and Milzy almost single-handedly took over the budget gaming market. And then it was all over. AMD officially announced they're reducing driver support for the last few straggling GCN cards in late 2023, meaning that soon they'll start to lose relevance for gamers. Of course, like any good entrepreneurs, this wasn't going to stop them. They just moved on to RDNA. The RX 5500 was originally an OEM GPU. Look it up on Tech Power Up, you'll see a 4GB RDNA 1 based card that's practically identical to the more widely available 5500 XT, and it was sold primarily by Printer Cartel HP. How they ended up in a Milzy card on AliExpress is unknown. I find it hard to believe that HP had enough leftover or faulty RX 5500s to just discard like this, so perhaps they've been salvaged from the 5500M laptop version. Either way, the enterprising folks over at those unpronounceable company names seem to have found themselves a stockpile of these GPUs and given them a gaming desktop makeover. Unlike the shady RX 580s, which were a disappointing drop in spec from the real thing, these are full fat RX 5500s, practically 5500 XTs, with 8GB of GDDR6. This is a pretty significant thing in 2024. As I mentioned before, there aren't a lot of good options under £150 for people who don't want to buy something that's explicitly secondhand. While these RX 5500s, 5500 XTs, and other 5000 series Radeons aren't exactly new either, they come in official looking boxes, aren't covered in rust, and don't smell of cigarettes. And these things matter to people. More importantly, they're current-ish. The RDNA 1 architecture is two generations behind the times, but AMD seem to have switched focus with entry-level RDNA 3 towards integrated graphics, and RDNA 2's RX 6400 and 6500 XT have only 4GB of VRAM on a 64-bit bus. Despite being older, having lower clock speeds than the newer models, and lacking ray tracing support, the first gen RX 5000 series cards offer about the best value for money right now, and that makes them very relevant. Despite its shady origins, the experience of using the Milzy RX 5500 is pretty much no different from using a genuine card from any other, more familiar AMD board partner. Windows detects the card automatically and will install the correct, if dated, drivers, and downloading the latest driver set from the AMD website works as you'd expect. GPU-Z and MSI Afterburner both recognise it as an RX 5500 with 8 gigs of VRAM, and the Adrenaline software works as expected. The reason this is worth mentioning is that the same can't be said of all graphics cards being sold by random brands. YouTube has plenty of accounts of people attempting to use dodgy brand Nvidia cards and being instructed to use unofficial drivers, as the official ones just don't work. I'm aware those cards now have a more universal, community-made Frankenstein driver available, but it's still something of a red flag for me that I haven't quite decided if I'm ready to ignore for a future review. It's why I haven't touched the 8GB RTX A2000 yet. To run the RX 5500 8GB through its paces, I have 10 games and one gaming PC to test them on. The moderately priced gaming PC 2024 edition has a Ryzen 5 7500F and 32GB of DDR5 6000 with smart access memory enabled. 
So for this one, I've decided to mix up my game order a bit because starting budget GPU tests with Alan Wake 2 is just depressing. Fortnite plays like a dream, at least once you've downloaded the streaming assets from the Epic launcher. And while serious players will want to run in performance mode or at low settings in DX12, this car does have enough power to obtain over 100 FPS at native 1080p with medium settings. Call of Duty Warzone is also a smooth experience at 1080p using the basic preset and, again, no upscaling needed. The 76 FPS average is certainly playable, though there's one preset below this if you need something a bit more competitive. Ok, enough putting it off. Alan Wake 2 really needs something the RX 5500 doesn't have. DX 12.2 support. The worst case scenario for cards that lack this API, also known as DX 12 Ultimate, is that they have bizarre visual glitches as seen on the Vega series GPUs. Thankfully the only downside on the RX 5500 is relatively terrible performance. 1080 low with FSR performance might seem extreme, but it only manages just under 30 FPS on average. Losing the upscaling is far worse, averaging 19 FPS at native resolution. Avatar Frontiers of Kirat is another modern demanding game, but at least it's perfectly satisfied with regular old DX12. As such, it's possible to get a modest frame rate in the benchmark without resorting to heavy handed upscaling. At 1080 low with fixed ultra quality upscaling and TAA, the game runs at a not intolerable 39 FPS. Somewhat excitingly, it also supports FSR frame generation, which the RX 5500 is seemingly completely compatible with. I haven't fully decided how I feel about FG yet, but if you're happy to give it a shot, I found that at 1080 high with quality FSR and frame gen enabled, you can get what looks like 65 FPS. Starfield does favour AMD graphics cards somewhat, if less so than at launch, but the RX 5500 is still a little bit too low for this very demanding title. At 1080 medium without upscaling, the average frame rate is just 30 FPS. I enable 75% scaling using FSR, which perhaps isn't the best choice as it doesn't match up with any of the scaling factors of any of the official FSR presets, but it's too late now. Anyway, now it still looks okay but runs at 37 FPS and the 1% lows remain above 30. Resident Evil 4 Remake not only runs extremely well on the RX 5500, it also really appreciates the 8 gigs of available VRAM. The balanced preset will give the newer RX 6500 XT a hard time, as it needs more than 4 gigs. And despite what I've heard about the memory management being fixed, I've seen this game quit to desktop when it ran out of VRAM, and quite recently too. At balanced, it can run at 67 FPS on average. If you want to turn settings up a little, there's certainly room to do so, and at the prioritised graphics preset, the game now runs at a 60 average, though it does drop below that often enough to be less than smooth. 60 FPS in The Last of Us is unfortunately not on the cards, without upscaling. At native resolution, the low preset only manages to push just over the 50 FPS mark. Which should be fine, and we should all embrace PAL as the logical refresh rate for fiscally and ecologically responsible gamers, but NTSC zealots will probably need to add at least a balanced FSR to hit the 60 mark. If you're happy at 30 FPS, the medium preset can deliver a 39 average and 1% once more above 30. Ratchet & Clank is from the same studio that brought us Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered and Miles Morales, but despite not having Manhattan to render, it's actually a fair bit more demanding than those games. At 1080 medium without upscaling, it scores an average of just 45 FPS, with lows of only 25. Though it does have a range of upscaling options which I wouldn't get too liberal with as at the lower settings, some of the particles can get a bit messy. 
Cyberpunk 2077 fares about the same as Ratchet & Clank, only with more consistent frame pacing. 1080 medium is once more my preferred baseline for this game, and at those settings the 5500 manages 44 FPS with lows of 37. Finally, Forza Horizon 5 actually runs like a dream, and you could probably turn up above the high preset and still have an excellent time. Still, I think high is a good looking option and one that can deliver a solid 90 plus frame rate without sacrificing the game's good looks. I'll admit it, I'm a bit of a brand snob, so I was perhaps not quite inclined to give this AliExpress model a fair shot. Sapphire and XFX branded RX 5500 XTs cost £100 or more on the used market, and compared to the much better performing RX 5600 XT and 5700 XT, they just don't look like good value. The Mil Z RX 5500 offers the same boost frequencies, core counts and memory subsystems as the official cards, has essentially no downsides that I could find, and at £65 before import duty it's pretty much a steal, especially when compared to the twice as expensive RTX 3056 gigabytes. If you'd like to see how they compare, check out last week's video which is linked on screen. Now, thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.